when you bring the mind to the breath, you're developing a good vantage point. A good place to look at what's going on in the body. A good place to look at what's going on in the mind. And a good place to look at what's going on in your life. Because there tends to be a lot of confusion in all three areas. Because the mind is running around in the midst of things. In the body there's a pain here, there's a pain there. In the mind, of course, there are all kinds of thoughts coming around. And in your life there are all kinds of people, all kinds of decisions that have to be made, all kinds of influences on your thoughts. There's a passage where the Buddha compares bringing the mind to the breath, bringing it to concentration, a step, taking the mind up to a tower where you're above the ordinary turmoil of things. You can start seeing the larger picture. In terms of the body, it's a good place to check out on how the body feels inside, because the breath is the main property of the body that influences the others. And when things aren't going well, you can sense it in the breath. And at the same time, you can use the breath as, as medicine to treat some of the imbalances in the body. So you want to take some time to get in touch not only with the breath coming in and going out, but the flow of energy in the body. how the body feels from the inside. The concept may be foreign to a lot of us, this idea of breath energy flowing in the body. But just think of it as just the basic feeling tone of the body. When you feel your hands from inside, what are you feeling? It's primarily that feeling, that's breath right there. The sense of where your arms are, your torso, your head, your legs. You got the breath, you got the blood flowing. These are the things that primarily make up your sense of the body. And so look at those feelings and ask yourself to, and to what extent are they like energy? Or if you were to see them as energy, what kind of energy would they be? Would they be good or bad? And seeing them as energy allows you to play with them more than just seeing them as a given. And you can simply use the power of thought to say, okay, wherever there's a blockage, think of relaxing. Wherever there's a sense of something stagnant, think of it being allowed to move. If we were to move, where would it go? In this way you open up new possibilities in how you relate to the body, how you hold the body, and open up more opportunities for the breath to really help maintain your health, a sense of well-being in the body that allows you to settle down and feel at home in the present moment. And of course, as you're paying attention to the breath, the mind is right here as well. You can think of the breath as a point where the mind and the body meet. And as you open up your awareness to the breath energy in the body, you're opening up your mind as well. Because the mind is surprisingly compartmented. Tends to focus in one area, then moves to something else, then moves to something else, and is very good at keeping everything compartmented and hiding things from itself. But as you open up to the breath energy throughout the body, you begin to open up all those closed doors in the mind as well. And when thoughts come bubbling up, you'll see them. And especially in the beginning of the meditation, it's hard not to go along with them.
But one of the talents you develop is learning to see a thought and not enter into it. It's like a car driving up. You have the choice of jumping in the car or not. Most of us don't realize, realize we have the choice. Or walking past a TV set while some show was on, then deciding that no, you don't want to enter into the show. You can see the see what's going on, but you don't have to get involved. It's the same way with your thoughts. Think of them as different things that are being proposed by the committee, and you don't necessarily have to take up the proposal. And the thoughts just go through. They arise and they pass away. And because you have a foundation in the body, you can look at the mind and be in a better position to gauge the thoughts of what things are really worth getting involved with and what things are not. First, you want to develop the talent not to get involved. It's like when they teach Thai boxing, the first thing they teach you is how to withdraw, how to pull away from your opponent. Once you get it pulling, good at pulling away, then you can enter into it, into the fight, knowing that you have that talent to pull it out at any time. It's the same way with your thinking. We know that at some point you're going to want to start examining your thoughts. But to do that well, you have to be in a position that you can pull yourself out of any thought world at any time, when you see the examination is not getting anywhere. So as soon as you notice a thought coming up in this range of the body, breath, and mind, all of which are gathered here, your immediate reaction should be just to let it go. When things get really still inside, you can be like a spider in the middle of a web. Usually the spider actually goes off to one side, but it's sensitive to whatever's going on in the web. And wherever a fly or another insect comes in and gets caught on the web, the spider immediately goes out there, deals with it, then goes back to its original spot. So you have your spot here in the body, aware of the whole range of the body. And then whenever there's a stirring of a thought world, try to see where do you feel it in the body. Focus your attention there, deal with the tanglement and the breath energy there. It's like zapping it. And then go back to your home base and wait for the next thought stirring to develop. And as you get quicker and quicker at this, you begin to see more clear the stages and how a thought world forms and how you decide to go into it and what happens as a result. And that's an important skill right there, and learning how to understand how the mind functions and how intention gets involved in creating your sense of the present moment. And as you get more and more talented, more and more skilled here. It also puts you in a good vantage point to look at your life as a whole. Where is your life going? What would be a really good way of spending your time, the little time you have remaining? That word little, of course, is relative. Some of us have a few years left, some of us have a few days left, some of us have lots of years left, but it's still not that much time. It's one of the qualities of time that you learn, as you, especially as you grow older. It just eats things up. They disappear, disappear. You have memories, but the, even then the memories begin to erode. So you have to realize that time, there's not much time. But that's no reason to give up on the future. You have to plan. You have to have some sense of what you would like to accomplish. As we were saying today, there are four qualities you want to bring to this contemplation. One is discernment, looking at what is really a good thing to accomplish with life. The time you have remaining, you want to look at your strengths, you want to look at your weaknesses, 
What strengths do you have to bring? How can they be developed? How can you build on your strengths? And what would be a good use of them? That's when you've decided what you want. Then the other part of discernment is figuring out a good way to go about it. What's the most skillful way to act toward that particular goal? Realize that you may or may not live to see the goal accomplished. But what you do know is that as you work toward the goal, you're going to develop certain qualities of mind. What qualities do you want to develop? The Buddha suggests several lists of qualities. One is conviction, generosity, virtue, discernment. Another is a list of what he calls the seven treasures. It starts again with conviction, which I mean conviction in the, the fact that what you do is important. Not necessarily important in the eyes of the world, but it's going to be important in shaping your life, shaping your mind. So you want to be as skillful as possible in your intentions, which means not only having good intentions, but having wise intentions. Because good intentions can be extremely diluted. You mean well, but you really don't understand what's going on. So you have to learn from trial and error. That's how wisdom is developed. And there's virtue. You want to make sure you don't harm anyone. Sense of shame and compunction. If the idea of something, doing something harmful comes up in the mind, you would feel ashamed to do it. Notice this is the not being ashamed about yourself, ashamed at the action. And being ashamed at the action is the, the counterpart, of <coughs> counterpart of having a good sense of self-esteem, realizing that you're above that kind of action and would be ashamed to stoop to do it. This quality is paired with compunction, as I said, which from the Buddhist point of view means realizing that certain actions are going to have harmful results and you just don't want to cause that harm. You're concerned about the, the results of your actions. You're not apathetic. And there are three other treasures. There's knowledge that you develop from listening and learning, generosity and discernment. And the, the Buddha calls these treasures the treasures of the mind. Physical treasures, he said, can get washed away by floods, burned by fires, stolen by thieves, taken by hateful airs. But the treasures of the mind are built into the mind. And you realize that even if you don't live to see the results of your actions or the results of your go the, the goals that you've aimed at, you do have these qualities in your mind. If death came, it's like, like an evacuation order. You have to leave and there's no time to pack your bags. What you take with you is your skill sets. Just like refugees, you find yourself suddenly in a new land. You may not know anybody, but you've got your skill sets with you. And that's important. So this is all part of discernment, realizing that the wise approach to life is that you don't have much time, so you need to order your priorities, what's really important in life and what's not. And then figure out the best way to go about attaining what you would like to attain, knowing that even you don't live to see the results, at least you've got the good qualities of mind that you developed as part of that pursuit. The three other qualities that the Buddha mentioned are important for determination and truthfulness, in other words, staying true to your vision of what's important, and relinquishment. Realizing there's some things you've got to give up if you want to attain your goal. 
It's like playing a game of chess. You may like your pawns, you may like your bishop, you may like your knight or, or whatever. But sometimes you have to sacrifice them if you want to win the game. Of course you've got to sacrifice them. There's nobody who can play chess without sacrificing pieces. And this is something we tend to resist. We want to win at chess and keep all our pawns. That simply doesn't work that way. And so it's good to sit down and think about what you've relinquished, what you have to relinquish, and seeing how important it is that you do that and how you learn not to get worked up about it. This is the fourth quality, calm. Again, this fits in in several ways. One is you know that if you've chosen wisely, the mind is going to be calm as a result. That's one good way of measuring the, the wisdom of your actions. But also you've got to develop an attitude of calmness, of equanimity, toward the fact that there are going to be difficult things to do and difficult things to give up. if you really want to make the best use of your time. And so you learn to accept that fact and take it as take it in stride. Sometimes the things you have to give up are things you really hold dearly. But there's a good story the Buddha tells about this. There's a, a poor man who has a little shack, not the best sort. A pot of pumpkin seeds, not the best sort. A wife, not the best sort. An old bed, not the best sort. And he sees the possibility of ordaining. But he just can't bring himself to do it. So even though his, the material things he's holding on to are not all that desirable, still they're a huge obstacle, a huge fetter. He compares this to someone who's very wealthy, has many wives of the best sort, <laughs> lots of wealth of the best sort, and that the person may be able to give it all up. So the fact that something may be dear to us doesn't mean that it's necessarily good for us. And the human mind is very arbitrary in what it holds on to. As the Buddha once said, we often suffer from aberrant perceptions, seeing permanence in things that are not constant, pleasure in things that are painful. We identify with things that really can't identify with, and beauty in things that are really not beautiful. It's all very strange what we hold dear. This doesn't apply just to things, it applies to all kinds of ideas and attitudes. But once you've decided that you have a particular goal in life, something that really is important, you've got to be willing to give up whatever doesn't fit in with that goal, whatever doesn't fit in with the path of practice leading to that goal, and accept this as part of the human condition. That's why you build on your strengths and let go of your hindrances, let go of your fetters. And so it's good to develop a state of concentration here, because it gives the mind a lot of strength it needs to be true to itself, not to be a traitor to its deepest motivation. And the strength to be able to give up things that are, are going to be difficult to give up. Knowing that you can develop a sense of well-being just sitting here with your eyes closed, focused on the breath. That gives you a lot of strength right there. So you want to develop this vantage point. Make it as solid as you can. After all, this was the vantage point from which the Buddha himself gained awakening. The mind solidly with the, with the breath. with a very clear and discerning sense of what's, what's important in life and what's not, what questions to ask, what questions to put aside. 
what are the problems that really need to be solved, and what strengths you have within yourself that you can develop to solve those problems. So try to develop this, this tower you have inside, or the potential for having this tower inside. We can get up above the crowd and see things from a larger perspective, both within and without.